Well, good morning. Welcome to Worship on the Hill. We're excited that um, all of you are here. Uh, for those of you who are our guests and maybe first time here, I'm John Green, Senior Pastor at Harmony Hill. Uh, and I want to welcome all of you to uh, Worship on the Hill. I want to ask you to take your Bibles this morning. Let me just say welcome to Worship on the Hill. I want to ask you to take your Bibles this morning and let's look in God's Old Testament. Notice that the, the title of the message, I hope, is provocative enough to get your attention. And we're going to be talking this morning, and we're going to be looking, if you get out your life point outlines or in your Sunday bulletin, if you haven't already done that. If you haven't already, I want you to turn to God's Word. Look the truth in your outline. But here's the truth in your outline I want you to notice this morning. And here's the truth in your outline, the inside. And the truth in your outline, the, look the truth in your outline. Will you this morning accept His free gift of grace? It's free. It's not cheap but it's free. So let's stand together. Stacy begins to lead us. You come, stand, kneel across the front, and when everybody's here, then I'm gonna lead us in prayer. Thank you for these 40 years. Thank you for letting me raise my boys here. Thank you for a church that has loved us. Thank you, Father, for planting us in a place and giving us a voice in the city for Jesus. I'm grateful for your extreme grace to us and for what you've made us into today. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, that got me teared up, Pastor John. Trying to come out here with some energy to start. Man, but welcome. Thank you all for being here today as we come primarily to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but also to honor our pastor of 50 years, Pastor John and Miss Catherine. We had such a great time honoring uh, and celebrating last night, and we look forward to how we're going to worship together today. A couple of things as we get started. If you could, and if there's room on your row, could we love one another and sort of scoot to the middle so that those that are coming in have places to sit? That would be incredibly helpful. As we, today, as you're making those movements, I do want to just say again, thank you for being here. If you're visiting with us, we are delighted that you are here. As we celebrate Pastor John, you may have noticed some of the banners in the foyer. Just incredible, incredible uh, these are conservative estimates, but Pastor John has probably preached more than 5,000 sermons over the last five decades, including weddings and funerals and Wednesday nights and Sunday nights and special occasions. Again, a conservative estimate, probably much higher, but Pastor John has led our church to give somewhere north of 8 to $10 million to the global impact for missions in the last five decades. And again, probably a very conservative estimate as we did not have computer records for the entire five decades that he's been in leadership. But somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,500 to 2,000 people have given their lives to Christ under his leadership. Absolutely, amen. And so as we prepare today, to honor him. I'm so excited about the music um, and how it ties into our celebration of both the Lord and the Greens leadership. But we also have a special guest that's going to be leading our time in the Word this morning. His name is Dr. Nathan Lorick. Uh, Dr. Lorick is the executive director of our state convention, the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention. Uh, he's also served as a trustee on the International Mission Board. Uh, he graduated from ETBU and earned degrees from Liberty uh, Baptist Theological Seminary. He lives in the Dallas-Fort Worth area with his wife, Jenna, and their four children. He's a leader in our state and for our faith and stands for conservative values. And so, Dr. Lorick, we are thrilled that you are here uh, to share the word and to share this occasion on behalf of the convention with us today. So he'll be coming a little bit later in our service. The last thing I want to share as we get started is this. Um, all month, from, from really this, month, uh, this week all the way through Thanksgiving, 
we are going to be collecting a love offering for the greens and so if you would like to participate in that and feel so led to do that you can use an offering envelope to mark green anniversary and make that contribution or you can go online or through the app and click on the drop down menu under giving for the green pastor 50th anniversary and we would appreciate that we'll be taking those all the way through thanksgiving and then we'll give that gift to them the sunday after thanksgiving Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to move into our time of worship this morning. Father, thank you for your steadfastness. Father, you are truly the same yesterday, today, and you will be the same tomorrow. We can bank on your compassion, your mercy, your loving kindness, your faithfulness to us. And Father, we are thankful that you have given us a leader in Pastor John for the last 50 years who has been compassionate and caring, a man of integrity, who preaches the word of truth, did not try to, as, as Paul wrote, try to tickle our ears with things we just want to hear, but spoke truth from your word. And that is how we have grown and why you have blessed us. Thank you for this church having a DNA of missions giving and sending. And Lord, today we commit our worship to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Todd. We're so glad that you are here with us today. We're going to be worshiping in two different styles today. We'll have our traditional, or not really tradition, it's a blended service. And, and but we're going to be singing a lot of traditional hymns this morning. I, I talked to Pastor uh, several weeks ago and I said, Pastor, I want you to to tell me some of the favorite songs that you have, have just enjoyed worshiping to through the years. And he gave me that list, and so I made a medley of those, and uh, we're going to be singing that all together. And it's going to start with a song called In the Sweet By and By We Shall Meet on That Beautiful Shore. Let's all stand together as we worship our Savior this morning.
washed by the blood. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Oh, are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Hallelujah! Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll, I'll, I'll fly away. Sing it out, church. I'll fly away. Oh, holy, I'll fly away. In the morning when I die, hallelujah, by and by. I'll, I'll, I'll fly away. Just a few more weary. Just a few more weary days and then, oh, I'll fly away. To a land where joy shall be.
Psalm 3, King David is under duress. He's running from his son Absalom, who is trying to take the kingdom, trying to take the throne. The problem was, is Absalom was not anointed or ordained to take the throne. It was still King David's, and he knew it. And he said, but you, O oh Lord, many are those around me who are, who are seeking to harm me, to kill me, to take my life. He said, but you, Lord, are my refuge and my strength. And I lay down and I slept and I awake because you sustain me. Thou, O oh Lord, are a shield.
Okay, so Pastor John is a pastor who's had a powerful impact on this community. He's been the kind of leader described in Exodus 18, 21, and 22. Exodus 18, 21, and 22 says, Furthermore, you shall select out of all the people able men who fear God, men of truth, those who hate dishonest gain, and you shall place these over them as leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And let them judge the people at all times, and let it be that every major dispute they will bring to you, but every minor dispute they themselves will judge. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. Pastor John is the most honest, wonderful, and the most God-fearing person I've ever known. His sermons have been filled with biblical truth, and his words of wisdom have been extremely enlightening. I know for sure that his influence will lead this church to prosper for many generations after, and we're all eternally grateful for his service. Thank you, Pastor John. Hi, my name is John Hicks. I'm a member of the Barnabas team and a member here at Harmony Hill Church. I was five years old when my family and I started coming to this church. One day in sixth grade, I was sitting in big church and Pastor John's words were really speaking to me. I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, it's time for you to get saved. So after the service, I talked with Pastor John and you led me in the prayer where I accepted Christ. That moment helped me to realize the difference people can make when they allow God to work through them. Pastor John has done so many amazing things for this church, and the things he has done will continue to bless us for years to come. Thank you for everything you have done for this church and for the people inside of it. Hey church, I'm Micah. And I'm Martha. And we're gonna ask some kids what they really think about Brother John and Catherine. Out of the mouth of babes. Let's go. All right. Come on. Hey, we got a question for you. Come here real quick. Who is Brother John? I can't remember. You can't remember? Okay. Who is Catherine? I don't know. You don't know? Okay, let's see. If I said Brother John was our pastor of the church, how many years do you think he has worked here at the church? One. One year? Just one? Oh my goodness. How long is one year? 302 days. 302 days. You got that one year and 302 days. Who is Brother John? Huh? Do you know who Brother John is? No. Yeah. Do you know who Catherine is? No. Okay. Do you know who Brother John is? Yes. What does he do? He preaches at our church. Brother John is the pastor uh, for the big group up there on Sundays. Miss Catherine's wife, and he runs the church. He's um, one of our pastors for the last 50 years. Agreed. Our pastor. He is a teaching guy and he does teach about God. He is the pastor of the big church and I usually go with my parents and he just teaches such good stories and I learn so much about God. Do you know who Catherine is? No. It's Brother John's wife. His wife? His wife. Ta, who is that? Pastor John? It's Pastor John, and who is standing by Pastor John? That one. That one? Do you know her name? I don't know. So, do you think they have been married a long time? Yes. How many years? Four. Four years. How old is Miss Catherine? Three. Three. Do you know who Brother John is? Carter, do you know who Catherine is? Mm. 
If I said Brother John was our pastor, how many years do you think he's worked here? 26. Uh, maybe for 10 years. 50 years. 50. 27 years. Five or six. About 50 years. 12. 12? How about you? 11. For one month. For one month? Very good. A lot. A hundred. One hundred. How old is Brother John? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Fifty-four. Hey, twenty-five. I'm guessing fifty-five. Um, twenty-five. How old do you think Brother John is? Ninety. Nine day. Ninety. Twenty. Twenty. Do you know how old Brother John is? Yeah, he's that old. 33? Probably 21. 48. 23. 200? 200 years old. Over 200. I think he likes to eat healthy because healthy makes you live longer and he's really old. So I'm guessing he's eating healthy to live longer. All right, Riley, who's a better preacher, Brother John or your dad? I have no idea. <laughs> what does Brother John like to do for fun? Um, spend time with us. Maybe go to Starbucks and get coffee. Go to the lake. Spend time with us. Preach. Watch TV. He helps people. He helps people for fun? That's good. I think. Sure. Mm, eat a cake. Swim in his pool. Swim in his pool, that's good. Teach soccer. Read a book. Play soccer. Very good. He's really good at this soccer gig. Eat popcorn. <laughs> um, dance killy. Boom, boom, boom. Do funny stuff like jokes. Okay, so do you think he's a comedian? Yes. Maybe fishing? <laughs> reads the Bible. So what do you think he does in his spare time? Studies his Bible. Studies his Bible, okay. Brother John, we thank you for being our pastor for 50 years. We love you. We love you, Pastor Clark and Thank you for 50 years. As you just heard, Brother John is 23 years old. He's been here one month. He likes to eat popcorn and pizza. And he teaches soccer for fun. Oh, and he also goes to Starbucks. So, this is Micah and Martha. And Martha. <laughs> signing off. Yes. <laughs> this is Micah. And this is Martha. Coming to you from, from HHBC, HHBC News. News. Brother John's landing the plane. Oh, so that means we have 15 more minutes. Yeah, that was awesome. Uh, so Stacy and the choir and the orchestra and the praise band, they took us through songs that I, they were great. I love your favorite songs, Pastor John. Those are awesome songs. Did y'all, y'all, y'all enjoyed them. So we're going to do something. Uh, we're going to do the whole, we're going to start from 1970 and go to right now. We're going to do a medley too at the beginning. And so we have a little surprise for y'all that at the end of every song will be the next decade. And uh, you'll get to see what Missing Ca... I don't know what I'm saying. Pastor John and Catherine looked like in that decade. Y'all ready? Let's do it. Good. 
wish I could see them. Go ahead. All right. See if y'all remember this one. Here we go. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. chance to sit down. Now let's stand up. On to the next decade.
next two songs we pick, especially this next one. I just thought about this day being a perfect day to sing about the Father and how he built, how he builds his church and that he does it. And then I put this church in the middle of that. I say, wow, what you have done, Lord, it's amazing how you've used Pastor John, how you've used different leaders in this church, how you've used the person standing by you to invite you to church. God's just so good, and this is all about celebrating Him. And so we're going to do these last two songs that are of the 2020s. And just sing with all your might. First time the whole church comes together. Team Cornerstone No other foundation Can be built Not for lots of feet Nor the wisdom of man On other ground Is
We're all here because of something that God led us from. I won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. As you found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God who fights for me, Lord of
you for giving us this opportunity right here to just sing praise songs to you. That, Father, we remind ourselves of who you are and how great you are. That, Father, that every day we can encourage one another, stir one up, Father, to love and to good works. You put the church together, Father. You're building it. You've drawn us from our sin into victory, from shame to now no condemnation. You are worthy of our praise. Thank you for this day. It is yours in Jesus' name. And the whole church gets to say, amen. You may be seated. Hi, my name is Steven Jansen, and I have been a member of Harmony Hill for the last 34 years. Uh, my earliest memories of Harmony Hill were a children's church. Uh, and uh, growing up in the uh, children's ministry. And uh, Brother John and Catherine were uh, giants in my life for such a long time. The two words that, uh, that come to my mind really quickly to describe John and Catherine's ministry and what they've meant to, to me and I think uh, to the church is faithfulness and integrity. John's faithfulness to the pulpit week in, week out, his faithfulness to God's Word, studying, being prepared uh, week to week. I have watched them lead with integrity and their life has been consistent. And that has been such a huge uh, example for, for me to grow up watching. In uh, 2008, um, I was going through a season of doubting my salvation and my relationship um, with uh, Jesus. And um, I reached a point that I needed to talk to somebody about it. Uh, Brother John set up an appointment. He was glad to meet with me and he took time out of his afternoon for me to drop by his office. I could tell he really listened and, uh, and he really poured uh, biblical uh, wisdom back into my life. And, and it was just a real tender moment with, with a pastor that leading a large church and a lot of other lives to be counseling with and um, stuff to be responsible for. And he took time out of his day to meet with me and to listen to me and to help me uh, through that moment. Hi, my name is Caleb Robinson. My family and I have been a part of Harmony Hill since 1992 and we are so grateful for everything that he has given us over the years and taught us, and for mostly his example. The number one thing that I can say about Brother John is that who you see is who he is as a person. Brother John Green is one of the most genuine, truthful, and honest people that you can ever come across. In the world that we live in, with so many pastors constantly in scandal, how amazing is it to have a pastor that you can count on that who he is in front of the church is the same person that he is behind closed doors. I wanna share a quick story that I always think about when I think about my time with Brother John. And I'm gonna go back to 1996 when I was six years old. I was at home with my mother and we were kneeling at the couch so that I could ask Jesus into my heart and ask for forgiveness for my sins. And the following Sunday, when we went to church, Brother John at the eight o'clock service on top of the hill was uh, made a call to walk the aisle if you had gotten saved. And I remember very clearly walking that long row all the way up to tell him that I'd accepted Jesus into my heart. And I got to stand at the back of the church as everybody left and I got to shake their hands with a big smile on my face because I knew my life was never gonna be the same. Hi, my name is Brent Compton, and I have been at Harmony Hill Baptist Church ever since I can remember. I have a very specific time in my life where I can, I can go back to almost 16 years ago. Um, in 2006, um, I was at a time in my life where I needed all the prayer and all the um, support I could get from my friends and my family and my church family. Um, I was in the hospital for about a month and I was in a position where I couldn't walk, I couldn't talk, and I couldn't even eat on my own. And Brother John 
made a trip to the hospital down in uh, Temple, Texas. And, you know, it's a pretty far drive, and for him to, to just be there for me when I needed, you know, him and needed my church the most, uh, you know, he was, he was there in a heartbeat, and, and I really, really appreciate that. My name is Billy Jack Smith, and by God's grace, I'm the pastor of Chestnut Drive Baptist Church uh, down the street from Harmony Hill. And I have known Brother Green and Miss Green since 2009. I got saved in 2009 uh, after surviving a car wreck. And uh, that next weekend, recovering from my injuries, I uh, bought a Bible and read the Gospels. and. Uh, got on my knees and asked Jesus to save me. And soon after that, I was hunting a, a church to attend and join. And I remember in Dybal, there was a billboard that said, life is hard, church shouldn't be hard. And it was Harmony Hill. Brother John has helped me a lot. He has helped me get into seminary and I've sat under his preaching and I still have most of his life point outlines from years and years that I've collected and I even still use a lot of them uh, for my preaching now and just sitting under his teaching, I always walked out of the church learn, learning something new, having my heart changed, having my the perspective of what I should do for the Lord and for the kingdom was clear and I thank Brother John for not only helping me to grow in Christ, but also helping uh, my wife and my two boys who uh, we were members of Harmony Hill. And um, I couldn't have been where I'm at today in ministry without Brother John and Miss Green. The kind of influence that John and Catherine have had in my life and my family's life is just incalculable. Um, so much influence, um, so much uh, encouragement over the years. Brother John, you've been such an incredible part of my life for so long, and I'm so thankful for who you are as a man and who you are as a godly leader and as a pastor. So thank you, Brother John and Catherine, for the influence you've had on my life, the influence you've had on Natalie and our family. So Brother John, thank you so much for all that you've done, for your consistency, for your honesty, and for never being afraid to tell the truth. Brother John and Miss Catherine, thank you so much for the 50 years that y'all put at Harmony Hill. Um, it's such a blessing to me, and I know to my family, uh, just the impact that you both have had on our lives. And just want to say again, just thank you so much. I, I give Brother John and Miss Green a, a big thank you for letting the Lord use them to make a difference in our life. Amen. What an incredible morning, Harmony. I'm so honored to be with you, but I'm as equally, if not more honored, to be with Pastor John and Miss Catherine this morning. I was thinking about this last night as I arrived here in Lufkin and went to the hotel. I thought, you know, I've been honored to be in a lot of churches and speak to a lot of places, but this is an honor I've never had, to honor a man of God who's been faithful to the Word of God for 50 years in a church. Harmony Hill, can I tell you this? That's right. Amen. Can I tell you this? We have a network of over 2,700 churches, and what we're experiencing together today is not normal. You have been supremely blessed by God above. And you ought to be thankful to God for that. And I, I would say this to you as you, alongside of Pastor John and Miss Catherine, have been faithful to the Lord, the Lord has been faithful to Harmony Hill as well. And so, Pastor, I'm so honored. This is really one of the honors of my ministry to be here today to celebrate alongside of you this monumental moment. And so thank you. I certainly feel inadequate. In fact, I feel today a little bit like I did a few years ago. My wife and I, we have four kids, three teenage boys in my house, so pray for me. Their whole half of the house 
Sounds like a locker room and smells like Axe body spray, so I stay away from their side of the house. And then our daughter is adopted from Uganda. A few years ago, my wife and I had a chance to sneak away. If you have young kids, you know how incredible, uh, refreshing that is. And it's Valentine's night, and we decided to go to a restaurant, and I'm just going to take her to this nice place that's just just uh, dim lit, and we're just going to stare at each other like we did when we dated, and it was just going to be awesome. And so we go to dinner, and, and uh, man, we start catching up, and the, the lights are faded, and it's just a nice evening for Valentine's evening, and the dinner's great, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the lights just turned off in the restaurant. And my wife was sitting there, and she just felt an embrace and a, a, a great, great kiss. And after the lights came back on, she said, honey, I got to tell you, you hadn't kissed me like that in a long, long time. I said, kiss you? What are you talking about? I didn't kiss you. <laughs> At the next table, there was this young GQ looking guy, and she said, well, I guess it was him. And I stood up and I said, I'm going to teach that guy a thing or two. And she said, sit down, baby, you can't teach him anything. <laughs> Let me make one disclaimer. That is not a true story. I would not be uh, able to stand before you today, <laughs> but I do feel like that today, thinking about the ministry of Pastor John and 50 years of biblical faithfulness and leadership and love to this congregation. I really honestly feel like I can't say anything today or teach you anything, but I do believe that the Lord wants us to honor Pastor John today, and in honoring Pastor John, we're honoring Christ because Scripture says it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. Pastor John has led and lived in such a way that he is crucified with Christ. It is no longer he lives, but Christ lives in him. So today, as we honor your pastor, we honor Christ as well. I want to invite you to turn to a passage of Scripture that I've been thinking about a lot lately as this date has been coming uh, to our calendars together, Acts chapter 20. In Acts chapter 20, there is an encounter between the Apostle Paul and a group of people he deeply loves. As you know, Paul spent time in the church at Ephesus, and he even writes a letter that is one of the greatest letters, I believe, in the epistles to the church at Ephesus. And this encounter that we're going to see is somewhat of the end of an era. It's a little bit of a parallel to the season of life of church you're in. Paul had walked deeply with these people. He loved these elders in the, the church at Ephesus. And so when it was time for him to depart, when it was time for him to transition away, when it was time for a new chapter in the church of Ephesus, Paul gathers together the elders of Ephesus. And in one sense, Paul is going to walk down memory lane much like we have today. In one sense, Paul is going to walk down memory lane with them and talk about the good times they had, but yet as we walk down memory lane with the Apostle Paul, we really see what kind of man and what kind of leader he was. And so today in our time, I just want to spend a few moments honoring Pastor John, but it applying to us in this sense. I want to speak this morning just for a few moments on marks of a great leader, and as we see these in the life of Apostle Paul, you're going to relate as of seeing these for 50 years in the life of Pastor John. And when you leave today, I hope that they sink deep in your heart that you can be that kind of a leader too, because all of us in this place today have some role of leadership in our life. Whether you're a pastor, whether you're a, a business leader, whether you're a school teacher, whether you're at home uh, taking care of the, the home, whatever it is, God has given you a sphere of influence and God has given you a sphere of leadership. And these principles that we're going to see out of the life of Paul today that you have seen and experienced in the life of your pastor and his family are also truths that are applicable to, uh, uh, to us in our own context. So with that being said, let's dive in together. And Pastor John, may I just say today, I hope we find the truth in the outline today, okay? <laughs> Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 17. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they had came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public from house to house 
testifying both to the Jews and the Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me that in every city, imprisonment and afflictions await me. But, pay attention to this, I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Four simple marks of a great leader that we see in the life of Paul that you've experienced and paralleled in the life of your pastor and his family that you could apply to your life today. The first mark of a great leader that we see in the life of Paul found in this conversation with the elders at Ephesus as Paul was saying goodbye and transitioning is simply this, that a great leader lives with an authenticity that embraces brokenness. Look what Paul says in the text when he says, I want you to know how I lived among you the whole time. So Paul, right at the beginning, lays out for them that I'm not just coming to you with words. I'm not just coming to you on a stage. I'm not just coming to you with lights. I'm not just on the forefront. You got to see how I lived among you. You got to see the good, the bad, and the ugly. You got to see the mountaintops, and you got to experience the valleys with me. So you did not just see me at my best. You saw me all the time. And so when he says this, here's what he says. When I set foot among you, you saw how I lived among you when I set foot in Asia. And here's what he says, serving the Lord with all humility and tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. The first principle of a mark of a great leader is a authenticity that embraces brokenness. The greatest mark of a leader is a leader being able to say and understand, embrace, and teach that he doesn't have it all together. Listen to what Paul says. I didn't come to you having it all together. I did not come to you and lead among you and live among you as if I never had brokenness, as if I never made mistakes. Now listen to what he says. I came to you in all humility and tears and trials and opposition. Look what he says. I, I lived among you. I led among you with humility. Now I'm sure Harmony Hill, that you would agree with me that John Green is one of the most humble men you have ever met. My time around him, I always walk away thinking, man, I want to be like that. I want to know that the Lord Jesus loves me, that my family loves me, that the people that I do life with love me, but I want to love them with all humility. Pastor John, you've, you've modeled that so well for your family, for your church, for all of these folks. This is what Paul says. He says, I didn't come to you as if I had it together. I came and I lived among you from the first moment I stepped foot in Asia. I did so with all humility. But listen to what else he says with brokenness, with tears. You know, I've come to the place in life where I no longer trust a leader who hasn't been broken. Because I believe that when you look in Scripture, the pattern of God is he calls he breaks, and then he blesses. The greatest leader in the kingdom are the leaders who walk with a spiritual limp because they've gone through deep seasons of brokenness that God has revealed to them their own humanity and therefore causing them to live in dependence on the spirit of God and walking in humility and brokenness. And I love what Paul says. I didn't come to you with arrogance. I didn't come to you with, 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 with knowledge puffed up. He said, I came to you serving with humility. And listen to what he says, with tears. Man, when I think about the apostle Paul, I think about a tough man. I think about a guy that was not afraid of anything, a guy that if you read his, his uh, resume of suffering, he's been shipwrecked and, and, uh, and hungry and cold and beaten and all of these different things. He continuously faced severe persecution and opposition. And I just think of a guy who stood firm. And I'm so glad that Scripture records that Paul was a man in which tears fell from his eyes. Because it shows his humanity, it shows his brokenness. And here we see what Paul says. I didn't come to you only in humility, but in tears, trials, things that happen. Now, Pastor John, I, I got to admit to you, I thought about this this morning, and uh, you, you started pastoring this church almost a decade before I was even conceived. 
And I would have to believe that it's not all been mountaintop experiences. Life is hard. If you don't believe me, wait till you get three teenage boys in your house. Friends, life is hard. The uncertainty, the un unexpected, the trials, the loss, the grief, the sorrow, the pain. It's not always incredible mountaintop experiences. You would know if you've lived at any, if for any length of time that life is hard. And that's what I love about this mark of a leader is when he says authenticity is not afraid to say, look, I'm broken in humility, depending on the Lord with tears and the trials that come my way are constantly shaping me. Not only that, the opposition that came. My mother, who uh, went to be with the Lord when she was 59, she went to sleep and never woke up back in 2015. My mom, growing up, she was five foot tall. And so she was a little spunky lady. Now, do not mistake the lack of stature for the lack of velocity in her swing as she <laughs> punished me. She didn't have as far back to go, so, man, she could get that, that paddle coming quickly. Well, when I was a kid, we were in the grocery store, and, you know, she told me that I acted up. I've never fully understood the, how I would come to believe that, but she said, you acted up in the grocery store, and you embarrassed me. Now, if any of you have kids, you know what I'm saying. And my mom, as is, is, uh, short as she was, she got down in my face, and she pointed her finger in my face, and she said these words, you wait till I get you home. <laughs> Anybody know what that meant? <laughs> well, being the nature that, is, that I am, I'm kind of hard-headed, I'm kind of stubborn, I thought, well, man, if I'm going to get spanking, I might as well just get two swats. <laughs> and so I just acted up as double. She was so mad, she was embarrassed, and we got in the car, and I'm in the back seat, and have you ever been in the back seat where somebody was so mad in the front, they're just talking to themselves, I can't believe it, I, I, you know, and, and all of a sudden, she's so mad, she can't wait to get me home, she's going to paddle me, and man, I knew I had it coming, and all of a sudden, she was sitting up front, and she heard me sing this little song. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. You remember this? It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth, and Jupiter and Mars. I love how patient he must be because he's still working on me. Now, I have no idea why I still remember that song, but it got me out of a double spanking. Praise God. <laughs> but here's the truth of the matter, friends. Whatever sphere of influence you have, whatever lane of leadership you're in, he's still working on you to make you what you ought to be. By the way, today, together, collectively, we ought to say thank you, Lord, because how patient he must be because <laughs> he's still working on me. The truth is, friends, God's still working on you. And as you lead forward in whatever lane of life that you lead forward in, do so with an authenticity that realizes you're broken, that realizes you're dependent on the Spirit of God, that realizes that you may have gifts and abilities, and those gifts and abilities are great, but honestly, depending on the Spirit of God in the midst of good times, in the midst of trials, not losing your tears, but embracing your brokenness in God. This is what we see in the life of the Apostle Paul, and this is what I believe you've seen in the life of your pastor, a man who's walked humbly before the Lord and humbly among you because he knows who he is and who God is, and he knows how dependent on the Spirit of God he must be. So mark number one is an authenticity that embraces brokenness. Mark number two is a conviction that doesn't change with the circumstances. Let's continue in the text. Look what he says in verse 20. Not only was he humble and with tears? But he says in verse 20, And how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public from house to house, testifying both to Jews and the Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So mark number one is an authenticity that embraces brokenness. Mark number two is a conviction that doesn't change with circumstances. Oh, how I would love to sit, Pastor John, and Pick your brain and as to how much the culture has changed in your 50 years as pastor. The ever-changing winds of culture put pressure on a pastor to try to navigate the changing culture while standing firm, yet 
The greatest leaders in the kingdom of God do not allow the winds of culture to change their firm biblical convictions. In Harmony Hill, you are today, 50 years later, who you are because you have a man who had biblical convictions day one and he still holds firm to the truths of God's word in year 50. And that is the mark of a great leader. A man who has stood firm no matter what culture says, a man who has, has rooted himself in the word of God no matter what opposition has come, no matter what challenges have come, he knew to stand on the word of God and he knows the word of God is the only foundation in which a church like this can be built to the extent in which it's been built over the last 50 years. You see, a great leader doesn't change his conviction when circumstances change. This is what Paul says. Paul says, I want you to understand, even in humility and tears and trials, and he says, in the opposition, those plots that came with me through the Jews, here's what he said, I never shrank back from declaring to you anything that was, uh, uh, he, he said, I did not shrink from, to declaring from you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public from house to house, testifying to Jews and the Greeks, the repentance of God and our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, what Paul says, no matter what I faced, I stood firm on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Never wavering, never, never going to the left or to the right. I stood firm, always declaring to you that you must repent in the name of Jesus, turn to Christ, and have placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Harmony Hill, you should feel so blessed today that you are a church that stands firm on the inerrancy of the Word of God because your under-shepherd has stood firm on the inerrancy of the Word of God. You should feel blessed today that no matter what came your way, no matter what the culture says, Pastor John, week by week by week, got up and said, thus saith the Lord, and that's where we stand, and that's where we will stand. We will not falter. We will not move. We will stand on the foundation of the Word of God. And that's a great leader, friends, because that's hard. That's hard in today's culture. That's hard in today's Society in which everything is completely changing and in chaos and confused and pressurized for a man of God to say, no matter what comes my way, no matter what the consequences are, I will not move from declaring to you what is profitable, which is repentance in the Lord Jesus Christ and placing your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I will not move when it comes to the truth of God's word and the gospel. Friends, in your life, in your circle of influence, may I encourage you as the ever-changing winds of culture puts pressure on you, whether you're a business owner or you are in the education world, when, when the ever-changing culture says, you can't stand on the word of God, you can't stand for truth, you have to appease everyone, listen to me, my friends, you are a child of God first and whatever else fill in the blank after that. Stand true on the fir uh, firm on the word of God and the truth of Scripture. Follow after the leadership of Paul. Follow after the example that your pastor has set for you. Al Moeller, who is the president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, says this in a book that he wrote called The Conviction to Lead. He says, when, you're, when a leader walks into a room, a passion for truth better enter with him. Authentic leadership does not emerge out of a vacuum. The leadership that matters most is convictional, deeply convictional. This quality of leadership springs from those foundational beliefs that shape who we are and establish our beliefs about everything else. Convictions are not merely beliefs we hold. They are beliefs that hold us in their grip. We would not know who we are, but for these bedrock beliefs, and without them, we would not know how to lead. Friends, Paul tells us, number one, a mark of a great leader is an authenticity that lead, that embraces brokenness. A number two marker of a great leader is a conviction that doesn't change with the circumstance. Brother John, thank you for being an example of standing on the truth of God's word. When everything else fades, when everything else fails, you have stood on the infallible, inerrant word of God, and God has blessed you, blessed this church, and will continue to bless you. A third marker that we see that Paul says is, not only an authenticity that embraces brokenness and conviction that doesn't change the circumstances, but a resolve that advances the mission, even in times of uncertainty. Look what he says, verse 22. He says, and now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, 
except that the Holy Spirit testifies in me that in every city, imprisonment and afflictions await me. Paul, talking to these Ephesian elders, beginning the process of transitioning as he's going to leave in just a moment, he'll tell them, I'm leaving, you'll never see me again. They pray together, they weep bitterly as they send him and put him on the boat. Well, here he says, listen to me, here's what I want you men to know. God has called me to go forward and to Jerusalem, and I don't know what awaits for me. There's a lot of uncertainty of my future. There's a lot of uncertainty of what tomorrow looks like, but here's what I want you elders to know. Because God has called me to it, I'm going. The only thing I know is that difficulties await me. He says that imprisonment awaits. He says that's what the Spirit testified to him, that imprisonment would wait, await him. Afflictions around every corner, but yet even with the prospect of afflictions in the future, Paul simply said, God has called me, therefore I will place my faith in his ability to protect me, and I am going forward. In other words, the marker in Paul's life is that he was resolved to advance the mission, even in times of uncertainty, because the calling of God. Whatever leadership role you're in in your own life, you're going to face difficulties and afflictions will come. If God has called you, press forward, because the, the resolve in your heart in the times of uncertainty shows that you placed your faith in the Lord Jesus and his sovereignty and his ability. I know that the days over 50 years haven't always been easy and they've not always been without affliction. They've not always been without valleys and circumstances, but I'm so grateful that we see in the life of Paul and you've seen in the life of your pastor a man that didn't quit, did not give up. Rather, he was resolved to advance the mission forward. And can I just say to you this morning, when you're resolved to advance the mission forward, God does things in your life that you can't even fathom why. Because God is already in your tomorrow waiting on you to get there. In the midst of uncertainty, he's already there waiting on you. He's already there waiting on you to get there. He's living in that time and in that space. Let me illustrate this very personally, how this has taken root in my own life. Stacy and I had the privilege of serving together back in 2004 at a church in East Texas, and shortly after we left there, we were pastoring a church, and we had one son who is now 18, a senior in high school, and we had a series of uh, miscarriages, and we got pregnant, and we were so excited because things were going really, really well. And we go to the doctor on the day that we were going to find out what this child was excited to see. And I know some of you, I get it, some of you are saying, that's not fair. They didn't have those kind of ultrasounds when I had babies. I understand, but you also didn't ride to church on a donkey this morning, so thank God for advancement. Amen? <laughs> I, didn't want, I, want, I didn't want to take a bunch of green stuff back anyways. And so we went to find out what the baby was, and we go into the ultrasound room, and the lady comes in, and she begins the ultrasound, and after a moment or two, she says, could you excuse me for a minute? She slips out of the room, and I look at my wife, and tears are just coming down her eyes, and I just grab her hand. I say, sweetheart, I don't know what's going on, but here's what I know. God's going to get us through whatever we're facing. A few minutes later, the doctor walk in. He sits down. He begins to continue the ultrasound, and he begins to tell us those words that no parent wants to hear. He said, I don't know how to tell you guys this, but somewhere in the last day or two, your little baby's boy's heart has stopped beating. He looked at my wife and he said this. He said, you're going to have to come to the hospital tomorrow and deliver a stillborn little baby boy. And I tell you, we were just devastated. We go to our car, we shut the door, we just fall apart. We call our parents, we're scared, we tell them what's going on, they both sets of parents get in the car and begin traveling to us, and we go out to our little parsonage out by our little country church, scared to death. The next morning, I took my wife to East Texas Medical Center in Tyler, Texas, and I wheeled her in, knowing that when we came out, she wouldn't have a baby in her arms. And that morning, my wife bravely and courageously 
gave birth to our stillborn little boy named Connor. It's my job to go tell the family, so I walked out, and I was supposed to walk straight out of the door down the hallway, and the waiting room was through the double doors, but I saw a hallway here to the right, and I just walked down to the hallway, and church, I just, I dropped on my knees in that hallway in the middle of the hospital, and I held my arms up like this, and I said, God, I don't understand why you're doing this. We've surrendered to ministry. We're, we're pastoring a church. God, 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 I don't understand. Why have you done this to us? You ever been there? I don't say this very often, but let me tell you something, friends. God whispered something in my heart in that moment very clearly to me. And here's what the Spirit of God whispered in my heart. Nathan, I didn't do this to you. I'm doing this through you for someone else down the road. Can I be honest with you? I thought to myself, God, you are the creator of vocabulary, and that's the best you got. <laughs> got off my knees, told the family, we go home and begin the healing process. We lived in a little community in East Texas called Martin's Mill. Most of you have never heard of it. Back to illustrate it, the day that I was interviewing with the committee, I went out there. It was a church. In the backyard of the church was the school, and there was one gas station that I had to work really hard to convince my wife was actually a country store, not a gas station. There was an S-curve. That was it. I, I, I drove past the school into the S-curve. Outside of the school, there was a kid walking a goat on a leash while his dog ran loose, and I said, God, where are you calling me to? <laughs> Out in the middle of nowhere. A couple months later, I got a knock on the door of the Parsons on a Sunday afternoon. It was my youth pastor. He said, Nate, Pastor, I, there's a couple here that they want to talk to you. You need to come. And I thought to myself, man, this is Sunday afternoon. It's not good for anything but football and naps. Amen? He said, you need to come now. So I walk across the street. And I sit down with this young couple. I said, tell me what's going on. They said, we just moved here. Now, I'm telling you, you don't just move out there. They said, we just moved here. We were driving past this and just something told us we need to stop and talk to the person who leads this place. I said, well, okay, tell me what's going on. The young lady began to break down and she said, two weeks ago, we had a stillborn little girl. I said, time out. I went and got my wife. Came over and we sat down and we began to minister to this couple. Right there in our office, my office, that young man and that young lady, in the midst of their pain, in the midst of their crisis, gave their life to Jesus. That's a really cool story if it ends there. What I didn't tell you is when we had our little son, it was a funeral home about 20 minutes away in a town that I'd done a, a ton of funerals as the pastor. They called me and said, Pastor, we heard you lost your son. We'd love to do a funeral for you. We've got a burial plot if you want it but it's, it's in a whole nother town about 30 minutes away, but we're happy to provide it for you if you want to bury your little son. I said, thank you. We had nothing, man. I was pastoring a church of 33 people, and I thought it was the Taj Mahal, and I was Billy Graham. I said, we'll take it. So we went, and we buried our little son. So as we start talking to this couple, after they gave their life to Christ, we start kind of drilling down, and we begin to realize that our little baby boy and their little baby girl were born in the same, uh, were buried in the same cemetery some 30 minutes away. That's a really cool story if it ends there. So we begin to drill down and say, okay, when you pull in, what do you do? You go to the right, you go to the left, yeah, we go to the back. To the best of our knowledge and our ability, we realized that our little baby boy and their little baby girl were not only buried in the same cemetery some 30 minutes away, but to the best we could realize our little baby boy and their little baby girl were buried in plots right next to each other some 30 miles away. Tell me what kind of God does that. That's a pretty cool story if it ends there. I'll tell you what kind of God does that. 2017, so some 12 years later, God calls my family to go to Denver, Colorado to lead a network of churches there. We get there. My family gets into a private school in Arvada about 20 miles away and I had a church in Florida call me and say, hey, we've lost our pastor. Will you come fill in for us? So I got on a plane. I flew to Miami. I got a rental car. I drove up to Naples, Florida. I'm preaching in Naples, Florida, and I share this story about how God redeemed our pain. 
And he used it for his glory, for somebody's salvation. I get back on a plane, I go home. When I get home, the next morning my wife says, I've got a random Facebook message from a guy who says he needs to talk to you. I said, sure, give him my number. The guy calls me. He says, Nathan, you don't know me. He says, but were you just at Naples, Florida this weekend? I said, I was. He said, what you don't know is the choir that sang behind you, there was a guy that works with me in the choir. And he called me Sunday afternoon and told me and my wife, we've got to listen to this message because God wants to redeem what you're walking through the way he did this guest preacher. And he said, Nathan, what you don't know is last week, my wife and I had a stillborn little child. We've been so broken. And he said, we sat in our beds together and we watched this service and we heard how God had redeemed your pain for his glory. And we together held hands and cried out to God that God would use our pain for his glory, that he would use our difficulty for his name and his glory. And Nathan, you have given us hope that God is going to take in our deepest pain and use it for his glory. I said, praise God, brother. He said, by the way, where do you live? I said, I live in Westminster, Colorado, a northwest suburb of Denver. He said, you're kidding me. I said, no. I said, where do you live? He said, I live in Thornton, Colorado, five minutes away from where I lived. He said, is there any way we could get together? I said, sure. So we got together, and we began to have uh, coffee and then lunch, and we were just sharing the story of walking through the pain. And, and, and he goes, tell me about your family. I said, well, my family is, uh, goes to school at faith Christian in Arvada. And he goes, you're kidding me. I said, no. And he goes, I said, my wife teaches there. He goes, my family goes there. And he goes, what grades are your kids in? I said, well, my oldest son at the time, he's in eighth grade. And he goes, oh. He said, did you just speak at eighth grade graduation a few weeks ago? I said, I did. He said, I was there. He said, you're not going to believe this. My daughter is in eighth grade with your son. Now listen to this, friends. Don't miss this. Seven billion people on the earth. God brings us to a difficult moment in a place that nobody knows about, causes that, uh, allows that in our life, and utilizes it to lead somebody to Christ who had walked through that, who just happened to move out there, happened to drive by, happened to feel called to talk to me. They give their life to Christ. God has pieced those things together so that forever we are, uh, are, are bonded together because of our kids being buried in the same cemetery. God moves me a thousand plus miles away to Denver, Colorado to send me to Florida to talk about how he redeems pain back to Colorado to connect me with somebody five miles away whose kids go to a school 20 minutes away. But not only that, out of 7 billion people, his eighth grade daughter and my, my eighth grade son are in the same private school in Arvada, Colorado. What does God, listen, that is an incredible God who when you're resolved to allow God to use your life and your pain and your trials to advance his mission, he will take even your greatest moments of crisis and he'll use them for his glory and his fame. Let me say this. That's a pretty cool story if it ends there. I don't actually know the next chapter, but I just know it's not going to end there because I know that God is still redeeming. What do you mean? Listen, great leaders have resolved to advance the mission even in times of uncertainty. Whatever you're walking through, be a person that lives with authenticity that embraces your brokenness, depending on the Spirit of God. Whatever your leadership role is, be a person that does not change your conviction just because circumstances or culture changes. Stand firm on the word of God and be a leader like your pastor who no matter what comes your way, you are resolved to advance the mission and the gospel of Jesus Christ at all costs. The fourth mark, and we're done, is simply this, a perspective that helps us, keeps what really matters in focus to us. Listen to what he says, verse 24, I love this. The end of it, he tells these elders, I do not account my life of any value, nor is precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord to testify the gospel. Here's the deal, church. Your greatest pursuit is actually in his presence, not for your, your glory or for your accolades. Paul says this. Guys, I want you to know all that we've done together, everything's for him. 
Everything's for him. My life is of no value apart from his glory. I had the privilege of being an IMB trustee a few years ago. We always interviewed, interviewed uh, missionaries and incredible missionaries we put on the field. I was walking down the hallway of one of their buildings, and I caught a note that I keep in my Bible now. This is a handwritten note from a young lady by the name of Kieran. Kieran was called by God to go to a place in Iraq to serve on behalf of you, Harmony Hill, and us as Southern Baptists. She wrote this letter to her pastors that was not to be opened unless she, her life was taken on the mission field. Came across this letter she wrote to her pastors, and I took a picture of it. I want to read you just one excerpt from it. Dear Pastor Phil and Pastor Roger, you should only open this letter in the event of my death. When God calls, there are no regrets. I tried to share my heart with you as much as possible, my heart for the nations. Listen to this. I wasn't called to a place. I was called to him. To obey was my objective. To suffer was expected. Listen, she says this twice. His glory is my reward. His glory is my reward. Friends, 50 years ago, you had a young man who came to Lufkin, Texas, not called to a place primary, called to the presence of God. The place was just the expression, the assignment the Lord gave him. But you have a man and Pastor John and his family, Miss Catherine, who came here on faith because obedience was their objective. Knowing days would be hard. But at the end of the day, 50 years later, the declaration of a great leader, the declaration I know of your pastor's heart is of all the things you've seen done, all the things you've celebrated, all the things you've experienced together, it is for one reason and one reason only. His glory is our reward. His glory is our reward. Pastor John, thank you for being a man of God, a man of integrity, a man of faith, a man of the word of God, and thank you that you've lived your life unashamed, uncompromising for his glory. And brother, his glory today is your reward. Miss Catherine, thank you for standing by him every step of the way. There's not a thing he could have done without your support, your partnership in life and in ministry. May God bless you in the next chapter because you, my friend, are a great leader and his glory is your reward. Father, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that in the days to come, you would bless Pastor John and Miss Catherine and their family greater than you ever have before. And as they begin to look towards a new chapter, I pray that you would keep their days full of wonderful memories of Harmony Hill, but yet expectancy of being used by you in the future. God, thank you for this church the blessing that Pastor John has had of leading such a wonderful group of people. Would the greatest days for Harmony Hill be ahead for your glory, for your namesake? God, everything we've done today is for your glory, our reward. In Jesus' name, amen.
when the tempter would prevail, he will hold fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold. He must hold. Pastor John, would you and Miss Catherine come here for just a moment, please? I want to recognize you guys on behalf of 2,700 plus churches of the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention. You may or may not know, Brother John served on our executive board and gave incredible leadership to our network of churches and you, Harmony Hill, have been an incredible partner with this network of churches to reach Texas and impact the world together. And so Pastor John, the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention, by the way, we are honoring him as well in a couple of weeks at our state annual meeting with a Leaders Legacy Award and recognizing him in front of our churches as a man of God who has led well. But today, on behalf of the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention, in our network of churches, we want to give you just a couple of gifts. Number one is just a plaque that says, presented in recognition to John Green and celebrating your faithful service to the Lord through 50 years of ministry as pastor in your community. So brother, on behalf of the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention, thank you for an incredible job. Thank you so much.
This next gift is a little different, uh, but I want you to take it and have it and cherish it and pray for us in our network of churches every time you think. When I think about faithful pastors that have gone before us, one of the greatest pastors and theologians the world had ever known, a guy by the name of Charles Spurgeon. He pastored the Metropolitan Tabernacle in the 1800s. He's known as the Prince of Preachers. And so today, on behalf of the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention, I want to present a very special gift to Pastor John. This is a handwritten page of Charles Spurgeon's sermon notes in which he himself has edited in the handwriting of Charles Spurgeon with a certificate of authenticity and the passage he preached it on the day he preached it in the Metropolitan Tabernacle. So, Brother John, on behalf of the SBTC, this piece of history of the Charles Spurgeon handwritten sermon notes, I present to you on behalf of the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention. So, thank you. I appreciate you. Love you so much. Thank you. I'll explain more about it <laughs> later. Yeah. You want to put it in there? Uh, I, there's been so many things that have gone through my mind uh, last night, today. Um, and right now, I can't think of most of them. Uh, I didn't, I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to write anything down because uh, I just wanted to, you know, speak to you guys from my heart. Um, there's so many times that um, God called me, turned my life around, and uh, put in me this desire to serve him, and then sovereignly planted Catherine and I here uh, in East Texas. God revealed himself and gave me wisdom for the steps for me to make and I never, I don't know that I've ever been able to see much more than a step or two out in front of me. <clears throat> the one thing God uh, put inside of me, which I know I've told you guys before, was that I was never going to be able to accomplish what he wanted to do through me. I was simply a son of his for whom he chose an assignment. And this is why I made this is why <clears throat> this is why I made you. This is why I called you from that South Arkansas home and made you mine. And I'll let you know why I created you. And I created you to serve me to be a son, to preach my word, and to love my people. I have, I have loved this church at every stage of her life. There were only a few times when I asked permission to leave and I was denied. <laughs> and God finally made it clear after I tried him twice that he just said, if you stay, I'll bless you. And you know, I've told you that again and again. I would have never labeled myself a builder. When I see all the, that God has done on the campus, when I hear about all the souls that have been saved and the families who have come, the families that have passed through, and if there was anything that I always wanted to have in the hearts of you guys was um, that every one of us who 
are called by him have a calling. He saved us for a purpose. And so I have loved every stage of the development of this body. And I look out today and I see you guys. And I know that I know in the bottom of my heart that you are a testimony to a God who loves you. Who took a South Arkansas boy of no particular means or background, a common kid, grew up in living in the back rooms of a grocery store. And God took me and made him his son and planted me here. This is our home. Catherine and I don't want to be any place else, finally. I want to be here. And I want to thank you so much for the love you guys have shown us today. Thank you for your support. Thank you for sticking and staying. God has brought me to the place to where I'm at peace that, um, that what he put me here to do for this particular time, I have done. And now God's got something new. I don't know what that is yet, but I know uh, that he'll make that clear as as I go along. So Harmony Hill, I love you guys. I want to say to my senior staff, there have been so many men and women who have come through our leadership. And I appreciate each of them and what they have contributed. My father has given me a rich, rich gift. I have around me a team of um, professional musicians and leaders. I have a senior staff that I'll, ne I'll never be able to thank God enough for. These guys love the church on the hill. And God has assembled a great group of people to minister to you and to reach the nations. For his own purpose, he called me to build. I would have never done that, but that was his choice. And now I believe with all my heart that God has called Todd Coor to be an expander and to expand our borders. And we built up, and now we're going to go out. And I don't know everything God's going to do, but I am totally excited. And I'm going to be there. I will be rooting for him. He has my full support. I love him. He's a son in the faith. And I'm grateful to God that God's got a next generation of leadership for the hill. Would you say amen to that? Amen. amen. Yes. <laughs> Kathy, just help me. We, I talked about this, but I, the support staff um, that is around me, the tech team, um, I've just sat back. And I, I've been wowed uh, by everything. Everybody that's been involved, all of you, thank you so much from Catherine and myself for this weekend. We will never, uh, we'll never forget this. And Dr. Lorick, thank you. Uh, and JP, uh, for being here and coming and supporting us and making this uh, a very special day. Um, do I close or what's, what's next? I don't know the agenda.
All right, so I'm going to close then. All right, let's stand before the Lord. Would you do that? Father in heaven, thank you for what you've done today. Thank you, O oh God, for what you've done. Thank you for calling men and women over these last five decades to yourself. Thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Spirit of God, thank you for your work and ministry among us. Thank you for your presence that has made us alive and has made the word burn in our heart and our soul. Thank you for the love that you have raised up in the hearts of this people that we would say, here we are, send us. Our answer is yes to you. So we thank you for what lies ahead we, th we thank you that we know there is a, a future for us, that you have a plan for us. And as long as we say yes, you will lead us and guide us and bless the labor of our hands. We thank you and we praise you through Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. Thank you.